Okay, here's just a quick uh, explanation of how uh, ELISA data is analysed. Uh, so in your lab, you will have analysed either vitamin D or something else. And you may have got some data that looks like this. You may have got some data that looks like this. You may have got data that looks like this and you think it's wrong. So I'll just take through what we've got here. This is your nanograms per mil of whatever it is you're manage, measuring. It could even be milligrams per mil. It depends what you're measuring. Um, I've just set up a dilution series of a two-fold dilution, so 3,200, 1,600, and so on. So it's a, a two-fold serial dilution. And let's say we get an absorbance of you know, very low up to very high. If we plot that data, we will get a graph that looks like this, which is quite difficult to read off. And what you can see is this glass, the graph is also plateaued. But you've got a lot of data points down here. Now, this graph is not ideal because each data point, as we move this way, the distance between each data point doubles. Now, if we want to make that into a straight line, we can plot it instead of being a linear scale down here, we can plot it as a logarithmic scale. And one of the easiest ways to do that is to transform your concentration in nanograms per mil into a logarithmic scale. So this column here is your logarithmic scale. And the formula that I put in there is log to base 10 of whatever your concentration is. So you all know that 10 squared is 100, 10 cubed is 1,000. So your 1,000 data point is somewhere between your 2 and your 3. So what we then do is plot this data against each other on the scatter plot. I'm not going to plot me 0 because you can't have a, a log of 0 for mathematical reasons that I'll not go into. And if you plot that data, you get a graph like this, which is, shall we say, a little bit more of a straight line than this one. It's not a perfect straight line. This data point's a bit out. It's still hinting towards being a sigmoidally curved, maybe, but you can put a straight line through that data, even though it's not ideal data. Now, I've plotted my formula for this graph, and all you need to do is um, right-click on your graph, uh, add a trend line, and you can put various ones on. If you think it's exponential, you can put one on there. If you think it should be linear, and if you transform something from logarithmic to uh, from linear, well, from an exponential to a this sort of linear plot, you should be able to put a straight line through that data. Um, so let's just pretend that my data is better than it is and put a, a nice straight line through it. Display the equation on the chart display the R squared on the chart and what we can see is the R square is 95.6 which is not brilliant if it's perfect it would be 1 um, and you can see it said okay this is the formula for these sets of data points if you're going to assume it's a straight line and that's an assumption that you need to decide if you're going to make as a scientist but let's say we are going to do that what we've now got is a formula for our graph that we can read off our absorbances and find the corresponding value. So if you read off, let's say, 1.2 and it comes down to be 3, well, we're looking at the 3 being the logarithmic value, which would actually equal 1,000. Now, what we can now do is take this formula, rearrange it so that x, which is our nanograms per mil, the logarithm of it, uh, is on its own. So if we go y, which is our absorbance, plus 1.4799, which is what I put in here. So let's say here's a sample, a patient sample in C12. So C12 plus 1.4799, because we're rearranging this equation, put brackets around that, divide it by 0.8839, that will mathematically leave x on its own. x is our number that's related to our concentration. So by rearranging all of that, we've created a formula that basically puts uh, 0.6 into this equation, and it throws out the number 
Now 2.35 is effectively what you get when you read off this graph. You go along to 0.6 and you go down. So you go along to 0.6 and you come down and you get to this which is 2.35. Now that 2.35 is we need to then convert that into the real number. And this is where you use on Excel we use the power function. And the power function, I'll just delete that. Okay, so there, you can search in this little box for the power function and you do number is 10 because we're on a, a log to base 10 scale here and so it's 10 to the power 2.35 and that comes out with an answer of 225 so by what we've effectively done here we've taken data that looks like this we've done logarithms of that so we've got this straight line graph we then read off our values from here by importing our absorbance into this equation to find out what x is. So we put in our absorbance of 0.6, rearrange this equation. That is equivalent to drawing the line across and drawing downwards. That gives us 2.35, but then we need to convert the 2.35 back into the actual concentration. So that's why we've effectively gone 10 to the power 2.35. If it was 10 to the power 3, it would be 1,000. 10 to the power 2 would be 100. Now, just to convince you that this is not all nonsense, uh, if you look at your standard curve, um, your standard gave an absorbance of 0.43. That was 200. 400 was 0.8. And our sample with an absorbance of 0.6 is somewhere in between them. So the number that we come out with makes sense. So it means that we've not made a mistake on the calculation, although it might not be the world's greatest calibration graph. So all of this works if you've got an ELISA that works where you, if you add more stuff that you're trying to measure, like vitamin D, you get stronger absorbance. Now some ELISAs that you use may be competitive ELISAs, and these work by having um, the thing that you are measuring labeled. Now what happens is you add your sample to a known amount of uh, a reagent that contains the same thing. So if you're measuring vitamin D3, your sample's got a certain amount of vitamin D3, but you're going to put it into a well that contains a known amount of vitamin D3. The difference is the vitamin D3 that is already in that well, not from the patient, is labeled and that is what's going to give the signal. So in the absence of any vitamin D from your sample or your standard curve, you get a very high absorbance because there's nothing to compete out the labelled vitamin D. The vitamin D sticks to the antibody, stuck to the plate, and because it's labelled, it gives a signal. If you've got loads of, let's say, vitamin D in your sample, well, that will compete for the antibodies back on the plastic it will outcompete it so that the, the patient's vitamin D will bind to the antibody, but the labelled stuff in solution will not. So therefore you get a lower absorbance. And this is why in some ELISAs, and I don't know which way around they are, but one of the ELISAs that the group studied, if you plot the data linearly, you'll get a graph that looks something like this. And the first thing students say is, that's back to front. Well, it isn't. That's the way a... Um, competitive ELISA works. All we have to do now is do exactly the same principles. We need to plot the um, log of the standard against the absorbance. So let's insert scatter. And you get something that sort of looks like a bit of a sigmoidal curve. And you've got to judge whether you're going to put a straight line through that or try and plot a some sort of sigmoidal curve. But that's your scientific judgment. I can tell you how to put a straight line on that on Excel. But if you think that drawing a sigmoidal curve on there is more, more appropriate, that's what you need to do. But if you wanted to add a sigmoidal curve to that, you would go through exactly the same situation as before. 
move right click on the graph, format plot area, not like that. Right, uh, click on the data point, right click on it and do your add trend line just like before set equation on the chart, show the R squared on the chart and then you've got your line and you can plot your competitive ELISA data in exactly the same way just basically do exactly what we did for the um, non-competitive ELISA but um, do this for the competitive ELISA. Now you might want to think why would you do a competitive versus a non-competitive? Well a non-competitive ELISA is typically a sandwich ELISA where you've got an antibody stuck to the plastic then your protein of interest stuck to that and then a second antibody stuck to that. Now that works nicely for large proteins. If you're dealing with something very small like vitamin D or testosterone or something that's really small you're not going to be able to design two antibodies to recognize two different epitopes on that very small molecule. So for very small molecules we tend to do a competitive ELISA, for large proteins a standard non-competitive sandwich ELISA is normally appropriate. Okay so hopefully that will help you get through this sort of data analysis. I'm using an old version of Excel but the functions that I've just described should be the same in every version of Excel.